All right, let's start reading. It's only a short one. It's got nine verses. This is a little different. I hadn't expected. I I studied this psalm briefly in the past, but not in the detail I did this time. Um, and I forgot what it was about until I began preparing for this week. So let's start verse 1, Psalm 149, verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song, and his praise in the congregation of saints. By the way, the word saints in the Hebrew doesn't, uh, doesn't have anything to do with the word holiness, because the word saint comes from the word holy, or to be holy. I'll explain what that word actually means. It's a word we've talked about a lot as we've been going through the book of Psalms. I'll get to it later. In the congregation of saints, let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Let the saints, there's the same word again, be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen. That's, that means nations. And punishment upon the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints, same word a third time, praise ye the Lord. Now, I already had one person mention that he had some questions. And I said, why don't you ask the questions during the lesson? That's what we want to encourage everyone to do, to, to ask questions during the lesson, so I don't do all the talking. So I hope he'll do that when I get to the part where he has a question. If you have a question, I'd like you to feel free to ask, or if you have a comment you'd like to make. Is that a deal? Okay? Don't be backward. Don't be shy. That way, when I answer it, I can, everyone can benefit from the answer, not just one person. Right, okay. I have a question. Okay. Saints. Yes. I'm going to get to that, so it's coming. Does it apply to us, or is it applying to Israel? Yeah. Uh, well, it's talking. It's well in the context of the psalm. It's talking to Israel. Yeah. Are they it, the same type of saint as we are? Is it the same word? No, it's not the same word. That's what I was saying. It's not the same word that's used in the New Testament. Okay. It's a, it's a Hebrew word and. It doesn't really mean saint, but I'm going to explain what it means. If you'll hold on, I will get to it in the notes. Thank you. That's a good question. Okay. Psalm 149 is a Hillel psalm. Remember, that means praise. It's a psalm of praise, like the others in the last five, starting with Psalm 146. It starts and ends with hallelujah. The first expression is praise the Lord. That's We sometimes translate that in English, hallelujah. It's the short form of Yahweh. It's just Y-A-H. Hallelujah. And it ends with praise ye the Lord or hallelujah. It does manifest a relationship with these other psalms, especially with Psalm 148. The next paragraph we're going to talk about the connections with Psalm 148. The other psalms in this group note the fact that Yahweh favors his people. He brings them justice. That's in 146, verse 7. Gives them his words, 147, 19. And has not so dealt with any other nation like this, Psalm 147 and 20. Both Psalms 146, 9 and 147, 6 show that Yahweh will thwart and will bring down the wicked. So it does talk about God's going to do something against the wicked. But... They give no details as to how God's going to do that. Psalm 149 goes further in showing that Yahweh's people, the Israelites, are going to participate in using the sword to bring vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples. And then he calls it the judgment written in verse 9. 
They become agents of Yahweh in, in his judgments. And so that's one of the things that makes this psalm kind of different. The last several verses, as you noticed when we, when we read, starting in the last part of verse 6 through verse 9, talks about how they're going to be using a sword to execute vengeance upon the nations and punishment on the people. And then some of the details are given. You have a comment there, Dwayne? Is that just your hand resting on the pole? Okay. I thought maybe his hand was up and he was tired of holding it up and he had it on the pole. Okay. All right. Let's go to the next paragraph. Psalm 148 may well be the seed, I'm quoting here, from which this, this psalm developed. Derek Kidner suggested that. And, and then if you look at the last sentence in that paragraph, in that paragraph such similarities strongly favor Dalich. He's another commentary I use. His view that the same author wrote both psalms. He may be right on that because there's so many similarities in the words and phrases between this short psalm and the one that came before it. It may well be that the same author, and we don't know the name because it's not given, may have written both of them. Let's go, let's go back and finish this paragraph. Uh, in, in 148, the psalmist shows how the entire creation is one day going to participate in a grand choir of worship to Yahweh at the leadership of his own special people, verse 14. Here in 149, we see what happens to those who refuse to participate in this worship and, and service of Yahweh and how Yahweh's special people are connected with the divine justice. Psalm 148 concludes, if you look at verse 14 of, of, of Psalm 148, we read, He exalts the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints. There's that same word that we have three times in Psalm 149. Uh, Even of the children of Israel, a people that are near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. So, uh, that verse in, at the end of Psalm 148 mentions the special place of Yahweh's people, uh, further described as his godly ones, or his, as it's translated, saints, and the sons of Israel. It's probably better to translate that expression, godly ones, even though the word God isn't in, the name of God is not in the word either. The word that's used, I'll get to it now, it'll come later in the notes, the word is from Keseth. I've, I've mentioned this over and over and over again, and Keseth means loyal love. And the, it's, it's an adjective from that noun, Keseth, and it, it probably means people of loyal love. Those who have loyal love, they've experienced God's loyal love, and they express that loyal love back to God. So we get the word, the word saint is just a paraphrase. It has nothing to do with the actual meaning of the word. Uh, most likely, the idea is that they are kind, that they have received God's love, and that they manifest godly qualities in their lives. And so English translations have translated it godly people, or like King James did, saints, people who live faithfully and loyally to God and are godly in their lifestyle and the way they act in their relationship with God and their relationship with people. So that's the word that's translated saints. So it has nothing to do with the, the Greek word saints in the New Testament, which means holy people, holy ones. And that's what you think of when you think of a saint. You think of someone that's supposedly really holy. And we, we believers are saints according to the New Testament. But that's not the word that's used here. It's the word that comes from loyal love. These are the people that have received God's loyal love in their lives and are showing that loyal love back to God and also in relationship with other of God's people. That's the word that's being used here, okay? All right, uh, but anyway, what I want you to see, if you look at the last part of verse, four, uh, verse uh, of Psalm 148, it calls the people of God, it uses the word people, it uses the word saints, which is those, who have lo those of loyal love, and then it calls them the children of Israel. All three of those expressions are found at the beginning of Psalm 149. Uh, verse 1 talks about the, uh, the saints or those who have received God's loyal love. Verse 2 calls them Israel. And down in verse 4, they are called his people. Same three expressions. So see how those are tied together. Uh, and then also, uh, at, in verse 14 of 148, we read, um, The praise of all his saints 
And then if you look in the last verse of Psalm 149, we read about honor have all his saints. And so that's a very similar expression that's found in both of them. The praise of all his saints or those people of loyal love. And then at the end of this psalm, it's the honor of all the people of God's loyal love. Okay, so those are some of the similarities. Let's go to the middle paragraph there in the first page. This emphasis upon God's people as the object of his loyal love, there's where I explain it more, and thus those who manifest his loyal love back to himself and toward others, ties together this entire psalm. For the term is used at the end of verse 1, at the beginning of verse 5, which is the middle verse, and then again as the final word of verse 9 before the hallelujah. So that ties this whole psalm together. It shows that Yahweh takes pleasure in his people and thus beautifies the afflicted ones with salvation. Look at verse 4. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. Okay. Let's go to that uh, next to the last paragraph. The situation of this psalm. So what's the, what's the background of this psalm? We can't be absolutely sure. But it likely involves a time of significant victory given by the Lord. But the psalmist and his people realize that the battle is not yet finished. And there's more fighting that's going to have to take place in the future. More battles are going to be waged. Likely even in, at, maybe even they're looking ahead to the final days when God gives them complete victory. And when Israel, the Messiah comes and Israel, Israel, Israel rules over all the nations. They may even be looking ahead to that future time. As, and I have some comments here. As long as Satan leads the forces of rebellion, the very existence of the people of God trembles in the balance. They hope that as they go out to fight, God may again grant them victory. Arms must be used. Home and family must be fought for. They hope to achieve it, achieve a further victory, to share it with, uh, to share in it will be a noble distinction for all of the people who participate. Now, re remember, we're talking about Old Testament situation here, not New Testament. I'm going to comment on that in just a moment. Such a scenario is not the description of bloodthirstiness. There are a bunch of people that reject this psalm because they say it's a bloodthirsty psalm. It talks about taking a sword in your hand and killing people. It's not worthy to be in the Bible, some people feel. I disagree totally. Uh, it's not a description of bloodthirstiness. Was Joshua guilty of that of being bloodthirsty when fighting the Amalekites? Exodus chapter 17. How about Gideon when he fought against the Midianites? Judges chapter 7. What about King Asa when facing the Ethiopian confederacy and God sent him out and blessed him as, as he fought that battle? What about, of course, Israel when they conquered the Canaanites? I don't even mention that here. Was Nehemiah wrong to equip the wall builders with both trowels, you know, to, to help lay the bricks in the wall, and also with swords in their other hand? Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 16. Why not put the best construction on things biblical, asked Leupold, and I agree with him. We cannot be certain of the exact circumstances behind this psalm, though, like the others that have come just before it, I would suggest that possibly this one was written also in the days of Nehemiah. That's a good possibility, especially if it's written by the same author as Psalm 148. If any comments or questions so far, please feel free to ask. George, did you have a question? Oh, I already answered. Okay, very good. I'm glad I did. All right, let's go on to the last paragraph. Unfortunately, this psalm has been abused by its applications. Over, this is interesting. I just added this because I want you to see how the Bible has been abused by many people over the years. This psalm has been abused by its application over the centuries. For example, Catholic princes were, Roman Catholic princes were incited to warlike fervor at the beginning of the Thirty Years' War. Now, I, don't, I should have looked up when that took place. I think that was like in the... 19th century, or no, I think it's before that. 18th century, I'm not sure. Does anybody know the, the time frame of the Thirty Years' War? Anyway, we'll have to check it out later. I know it was several centuries back. Uh, 
so Catholics were destroying Protestants and those who wouldn't uh, support their views. And the war went on for 30 years. That's why it's called a 30 years war. So religious people were killing each other. Anyway, they referenced this psalm in starting this war. And likewise, there was a Protestant group used this psalm, Thomas M Munzer. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He incited the peasants to rebellion at the beginning of the peasants' war by using this psalm. Because of such misuse, some have had such a negative attitude toward the psalm so as practically to ignore it. However, many scriptures have been abused over the centuries, and misuse of scripture does not prove that the authors themselves had such unholy intentions. Surely this psalmist would not condone the abuses over the years. We must also remember the threefold reference in this psalm to the godly ones. That's what King James calls saints. The godly ones as the focus of this psalm. Thus, those whom this psalmist addresses are the sincerely godly persons in Israel. And they would hardly have carnal and wicked motivations for personal vengeance and gain. So they weren't out for personal vengeance. They didn't have wicked motives. They weren't starting a war that wasn't something God wanted to happen. They, they were doing what God intended them to do is the, is the main point. Now look at the next paragraph. Then we'll actually get into the detail of the psalm. The New Testament notes that somehow... Believers will participate even at the final judgment of sinners. Did you know we're going to participate at the final judgment? The New Testament says that. And of the world, even in the judgment and the battle of the great of the time of Christ's return. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, not now, but check it out later. Paul says, we will judge angels. We will judge angels? So we're going to be at the great white throne judgment, evidently. We're going to be participating with the Lord in that. Or maybe even at the beginning of the millennium when Satan is cast into the bottomless pit, we believers will be there with him and we may participate somehow. I don't know, maybe just as witnesses or saying our amen to what God is doing, but we're going to participate. Yes. That's what I just said. I don't know. No, we're talking about Satan's angels. <laughs> The, one, the ones that fell with the devil and who rebelled against God. Those are the ones that are going to be judged. Well, they're already condemned, yes, but they haven't been cast into, into hell yet. And so they're going to be cast there permanently and no more. they can do no more harm after that. So that, that's what we're talking about there. And so you also see Jude verses 24 and 25. And then Revelation chapter 19, when the Lord comes back, he comes back with his saints. Now, that includes the righteous angels that he comes back with, but it, it may also include the church that has been raptured to heaven, and we return with him when he comes to earth, and we're going to participate in the battle of Armageddon. Now, again, how do we participate? We're not going to be killing people with actual swords. The Lord's going to kill them with the word coming from his mouth. But we are his supporters. We are his army that will be with him, along with the angels that come with God. So this idea that the killing and shedding of blood is all wicked and bad, not when it's God doing righteous deed of punishment of those that are wicked. You got to keep. You got to distinguish what the Bible teaches here. So let's keep that in mind. Uh, reading on, however. How are we Christians supposed to act today? Are we supposed to get out there and fight? Are Republicans supposed to go out and kill Democrats and Democrats kill Republicans? That's the way it sounds like it's going to happen here, but that's obviously the wrong thing to do. It, politically, it's the wrong thing to do, and it's wrong for Christians to take up the sword today. So let's read, read what I commented on here. Um, in the current dispensation of grace, our armor is spiritual. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. The word of God is our sword, Hebrews 4.12. And the weapons of our warfare, I'm quoting from Paul here, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. And what are these fortresses? That consists of, quote, speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. 
What we take captive today is every thought. All that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. We take thoughts captive for the cause of Christ by using the sword of the word of God. See, that's our fight today. However, the day does come when judgments will be more outward and serious and permanent under Christ's sovereign power and leadership. And the Bible makes that clear. There will be actual killing that takes place and the wicked will be destroyed at the battle of Armageddon. All the armies of the earth are going to come together against Israel in the last days. And God's going to destroy all of them. And then there's going to be the judgment of the sheep and goats at the beginning of the millennium. We were talking about that the other day. And that before the millennium, all the wicked will be cast out and will, be, will go into eternal punishment. You read that. They go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous go into everlasting life. They go into the millennium, and then they continue on into the eternal state. And so all of these things are going to happen in some way and shape and form. Christians are going to be part of that. Any comments before I get into the actual psalm? Yes. Persians. Right. No, they weren't. And they didn't even have a king then. They didn't have a king or a ruler. Nehemiah was not a king. They wouldn't allow them to have a king. Now, some people think that part of the fulfillment of this was a couple hundred years later, about 250 or so years later, during the times of the Maccabees, the Jews did take up arms. And God did enable them. You read the book of Maccabees, which is not part of our Bible, but it's an interesting history book. It talks about how God gave their, their small little armies, relatively untrained and very, very, very unsophisticated weaponry. God enabled them to defeat the Greek armies, because the Greeks were in power then, not the Persians. And they were able to win victory after victory after victory at the blessing of God. It's amazing what happened. And they actually won their independence for a while from Greece. And then the Romans came in in the first century B.C. and conquered, and then that ended the Jewish independence. But there was a period of, oh, I can't remember how long, 50, 100 years or so, that the Jews won their independence from the Greek armies. But I don't think this passage is directly talking about that. They would have had, the psalmist would have had no way of knowing about that anyway. But he is looking forward to the fact in the future, in the eschatological future, when Israel is going to win victory over all their enemies one day and when Messiah will be their king. So I think you're right, Duane. I think it's primarily looking ahead to the future if this was written in the days of Nehemiah. Because you're right, they couldn't have fought battles right then. But they didn't know what was going to happen right then. They didn't know what was going to happen in the next 50 years or 100 years. They only knew that God had plans that were written down in Scripture and that Scripture would be fulfilled. Good. Okay. Let's continue with our actual psalm. And you ask more questions as you have them, please. So, you know, I want to be honest with you. I had a really difficult time outlining this psalm. <laughs> And so I probably didn't do a very good job. I did the best I could, especially as tired as I was when I finished it. But uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's look at what we have here and hope that it at least give you some things to think about and will be an encouragement to you. I've divided into two main parts. The first part, and I've roughly given verses with it, although there's some overlap in what, the way I discuss it. God takes pleasure in his people, verses 1 through 4. And then God's people take pleasure in doing God's work, verses 5 through 9. That's how I've divided it. So let's go ahead and look at it. Verse 4 is where I get the keynote for the theme of the first section. Praise him all, excuse me, I'm in the wrong song. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. All right, so such pleasure, going back to the outline, such pleasure is based upon God's grace, not on the good works of these people. I, I, I wanted to make that clear. And we have evidence for that even here. Notice the word meek there in verse 4. 
The word meek in Hebrew has the idea of people who are afflicted. And then not only are they afflicted, they're also humble. It's like the humble, afflicted people. Now, this shows that they're not receiving God's favor because they're so good or so worthy. They've been afflicted. Well, why were they afflicted? They must have been sinful. And God allowed all this to happen in their lives to purify them and draw them back to himself. And so they must have turned to God and they must have had asked for forgiveness and cleansing and also uh, had the fear of God. So I, I comment on that in the rest of this paragraph. Uh, they have gone through troubled times but have kept their confidence in God and have continued to fear him. Of course, Yahweh himself produces such meekness in those who have a relationship with him. He is pleased with, that's the verb that's used there in verse 4, he is pleased with, he accepts favorably such persons. The people deserve no personal merit, but have Yahweh's gracious favor to thank, for he chose them at Sinai, he picked them, they didn't pick him, and they accepted his covenant there in Exodus chapter 19. Psalm 147 verses 10 and 11 shows that Yahweh does not, quote, delight in human strength and self-ability, but rather, quote, he favors those who fear him, have godly reverence toward him, and those who wait upon his loving kindness. That's the word loyal love again. That's found right there in verses 10 and 11 of Psalm 147. The verb takes pleasure is also associated with Otherwise, it's used other places in the Old Testament for God accepting sacrifices that are offered to him, for the acceptance of Israel's sacrifices, and it may here allude to such atonement and forgiveness. So what I'm suggesting in verse 4 is God, God's taking pleasure in Israel is not because they're such a great people and they deserved him to have pleasure in them. You see what I'm saying? It's all of God's grace. They didn't deserve God's favor any more than you and I deserve God's favor today. But God has graciously shown them his favor. Let's go on to letter B. The objects of his pleasure are his people, Israel, and the saints. I referred to that earlier. Those, all three of those expressions are used. That is, godly ones, those who have experienced his loyal love and then manifest such loyal love back to God and to other people. C. He manifests such pleasure by granting them salvation. See that in verse 4? He will beautify the meek with salvation. The word beautify, he beautifies them with such salvation. The word means to adorn or to glorify or to beautify. I like the expression beautify for, the, for this word. He beautifies his people. What a nice expression. Salvation is what he beautifies us with. Salvation here is, is referring to spiritual salvation, but it also refers to outward salvation, deliverance, victory that he's given to his people Israel. So you have to look at the big picture. Don't think of just the way we use salvation in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, many of these passages, it's a broader word for all kinds of deliverance. It means to deliver. It's all the deliverances that God has given them, spiritual and outward and physical. God has saved his people in all those ways. Uh, such salvation merits the most lavish praise. And this is where my outline jumps all over the place because I'm looking at all the words for praise that we find in this psalm. And so let's list them. Hallelujah is found at the beginning and the end. It opens and closes it just like it does in those other four psalms in this group. Moreover, the same verb is used again in verse 3, let them praise. That's the same verb used there that's used in hallelujah. And there we're told to praise his name, and also that is to be accompanied with dancing. Okay, so do you want to do a holy dance together with me this morning? <laughs> I'm going to comment on dancing a little bit here. But it is in Scripture. But you must not think at all of the modern dancing that people do today, it's, unless it's some kind of a folk dance, because that would have more similarity with some of the folk dances that people do. Uh, but let's go on and look at, look at what we say here in the, in the following notes. Um, when, it, when he says there in this verse, verse 3, let him praise the name of God. The name speaks of all that God is and how he has shown himself 
to his people. That's the name of God. It's referring to God himself otherwise. And then, we must not confuse this dancing with modern dancing. Such was individual dancing. And most of the time when it's mentioned, there are ladies involved. Most of the references talk about ladies coming out with dancing and with timbrels in their hands. Anybody know what a timbrel is? Like a tambourine. It's like a tambourine. And what is it? It's a hoop with a piece of parchment over it. And it has little things that are little dangles attached to the side that when you hit it, it they make noise. Okay, it has, It's a percussion instrument, but the dangling things make jingling noises at the same time. Anybody ever played a tambourine here? Nope, I haven't. I'm just talking from what I've read. And I think maybe I've heard it a few times, but I've never actually played one. Okay, so that's what a tambourine is. Um, so, this was not done between men and women. An example of this kind of dancing is, is what David did when he came into Jerusalem with the Ark of the Covenant. Do you remember? It says he was jumping and leaping and praising God as he came. That's the kind of dancing we're talking about. And the, the Hebrew word from which this is translated, from which the word dance, means to twirl. To twirl. They would jump. I, can't even, I don't even know if I could do that at my age now. <laughs> you jump and you twirl around as you're jumping up in the air. I think I'd fall down flat if I tried to do it. But that's sort of the motion that was used in their dancing. And, and so it has nothing to do with men and women romantically dancing together. So don't ever try to use Old Testament dancing to justify the kind of dancing that goes on today. Yes? Uh huh. It was probably somewhat like that. I don't know what kind of music they were playing, but back then it probably wasn't rock music. Nowadays they use rock music. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Now we cannot say I can't spend much time on this because we could spend all of our time remaining talking about dancing, but. Um, Obviously, all kinds of dancing are not condemned by Scripture, okay? But there are some kinds of dance today that are sensual. Sensual and fleshly, and there's no doubt about it. You, I think you know what kind of dancing I'm talking about, and that is no place for the Christian. Uh, this kind of dancing might have an appropriate usage, might have an appropriate place if it's done properly. But let's go on. We can't spend any more time on that right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that hallelujah, we just talked about hallelujah. Then we have other words for praise in this psalm. Sing is used in verse 1. And it's joined with the new song, which is the song of a recent salvation or deliverance that God has brought them. And it's also used with his praise in verse 1. I talked about that. So let's go on to number 3. Israel is also to be glad, verse 2. Let Israel rejoice. The, the word rejoice has the idea of being glad. Some of these are just synonyms, and so you could use different English words to translate them, but they all mean basically the same thing. Israel is to be glad to take pleasure in their divine maker, in verse 2. Uh, they are also exhorted to rejoice, which is another synonym. The last part of verse 2, translated here, be joyful, but they, ba they mean basically the same thing. 5. They also use other instruments to pray, such as the timbrel or tambourine, and the lyre, which is a kind of a harp. It's a little different than a harp. You could check it out in the dictionary like I had to do to figure out how it's different from a harp. Uh, both percussion and stringed instruments otherwise were used. The use of dancing and timbrel and tambourine or tambourines was a typical means of celebration mentioned several times in Scripture. It wasn't used every time they got together at the temple. 
So that's the thing we need to distinguish. It was used at special times of celebration. So using them on a regular basis in church, I don't know if it would be appropriate. But special times of celebration, like at the Passover, at uh, Tabernacles, uh, after, especially after military victories, when they came back into the city and they were rejoicing and leaping and twirling, that's what David did when he brought the ark in. That was like a big victory to him to capture that from the Philistines and bring it back to Jerusalem. Uh, it was a big time of celebration. I have to go on because we only have five minutes left. So I don't think that dancing ought to be a regular part of church worship services, but there may be special occasions where it, something like that, an outward expression of exuberance and excitement and celebration would certainly be appropriate for Christians to practice. Okay, let's go on here. Um, we were six. They are also to exalt. That's found in verse... Uh, Five. Yeah, verse 5. Let them praise. That word actually, the word praise has the idea of to exult in the glory that they have received from, uh, from, from Yahweh and, and in their salvation in verse 5. They also exhorted to sing for joy. Uh, the last part of verse 5. Uh, I was looking at the wrong psalm. No wonder I was so confused. Oh, man, oh, man. I was looking at Psalm 448 and 449 in my Bible, are, and the verses are the same. They're directly across the, page, the, the column from each other. That's why I was exactly confused. I was looking at Psalm 448, and I said, where are the words I'm looking for? Okay, let the saints be joyful. That's the word exalt in glory. There's the word glory. Let them sing aloud. Uh, sing aloud. That means to make a loud sound, uh, a loud shout. This would be a shout of joy on their beds. Okay. They are ex exhorted to sing for joy by making a loud ringing cry unto the Lord. They do so on their beds, even at night. They meditate and rejoice on God's goodness. This is the place where in the past they have had many times of sadness. Many times they must have lay on their beds in sorrow and with tears. David often mentions he lay on his bed at night and cried. Well, here they're not crying. They're rejoicing. They're celebrating. They're praising God in the same place where sometimes in the past they had cried and were unhappy. Now, though the term is a noun, in verse 6, we see the word uh, high praises. The high praises of God round out the well-rounded description. I repeated myself, round out the well-rounded description of the exuberant praise from the people of God. And then finally, the worship is joined, joint, joint with other members of the congregation. Go back to verse 1. They are supposed to praise God in the congregation. So Christians aren't supposed to just worship by themselves. They're supposed to get together with other God's people and rejoice and worship together. And that's exactly what we do when we come together on the Lord's Day and other times. The God they worship is their king and their maker. Look back to verse 2. He is uh, the God who made them, made him. That's actually a participle, and you could translate it, their maker, the one who makes them. And also he is their king, he is their ruler. Now, finally, God's people take pleasure in his work. We somewhat talked about this, so we can just uh, go through this pretty quickly. They balance the praises of God they offer with, with their mouth, with the sword they hold in their hand, verse 6. We must not miss the word play in the Hebrew, because the word two-edged sword, I got, I got totally thrown off when I was looking at the Hebrew text here and trying to figure out what this word was I was looking at. I didn't even recognize the word. It was longer than the word for mouth. And then I realized it was the word mouth connected with the word mouth and the plural in one form. It's mouth and mouths. The word two-edged literally means mouth and mouths. The edge of the sword is sometimes called the mouth of the sword because what does it do when you swing it? It cuts people up. It kills them. It swallows them, so to speak. It eats them, destroys them. And so, so he's making a word play here when he says, I'm going to praise God with my mouth, and I'm also going to praise God by the, the, 
the mouth of the sword. Do you see what he's doing? The mouth and mouth of the sword, or the two-edged sword. It's a sword that has edges 